Hey guys, and welcome back to GCC. I'm Damon, and today I want to talk about a little game called Oxenfree that I played on the Switch. Oxenfree for the Switch was one of those underrated gems that totally blew me away. I got on sale a few months ago because I'd heard some good reviews about it. I remember starting it up late one night and hearing the first few lines of dialogue, but being so tired that I chose to hit the sack and try it again later. Next thing I know, Oxenfree is sitting in the back of my Switch's library, waiting patiently but never getting played. Fast forward to two days ago. While I was browsing my Switch for any games that were installed but I hadn't beaten yet, I stumbled across Oxenfree. The game icon looked familiar and the name rang a bell, but I couldn't remember what it was about. So I started up a new game and, and began to play. I played probably five hours that first day, exploring everything, backtracking a ton, and analyzing every radio station I could find throughout Edwards Island. The following day, I couldn't stop thinking about it, and when I finally got the chance to play it that night, I didn't stop until about 1am, when I had finally beaten the game. I laid there in bed, just thinking about the ending of this crazy little game, until I finally drifted off to sleep. For now, I'll try to stick to a spoiler-free review before I do a deep dive and do my take on the ending and what it means. As far as the platform that I played on, I think Oxenfree is a really good fit for the Switch. I know that's a meme nowadays, like, X game is perfect for the Switch, but I really think it just works. I love being able to grab my Switch off the dock and take it into the kitchen with me to play while I'm making dinner. I don't know, I just think this game lends itself to portability really, really well. Oxenfree doesn't have any real time and critical scenarios outside of dialogue responses, so being able to talk to Jonas, Clarissa, and Nona for a few minutes before setting the game back down just worked really well. That, coupled with the option to slap my Switch back in stock and pick up my game right where I left off without interruption, was awesome. The game is so fluid, with the events linked together so well, that being tied down to a stationary console wouldn't really do it justice unless you played the game all the way through without breaks. And while I think that's definitely doable for some people, I know many people, including myself, don't always have that much uninterrupted time to set aside. I really enjoyed Oxenfree, and I've been telling pretty much anyone who listened to give it a shot, especially since it seems to go on sale so frequently. I personally put it right up there with games like Gone Home and Firewatch. I totally understand that this game won't be for everyone, but I think if you enjoy an awesome story above all else, this will hit a home run for you as well. It's chock full of intrigue, mystery, and a dash of horror, not too much mind you, that when blended together creates a game that will likely hook you from the start and keep you playing until the end credits start to roll. I only have a few gripes about Oxenfree, all of which are minor and likely unique to me. I felt like a sprint button would have been really useful, especially during the parts where I was backtracking to find hidden items and lore. This one is mainly just personal preference, and my impatience is really starting to show through here, but the island feels surprisingly large, and the implementation of a faster running speed would have been awesome. Another small critique I had was the load times. Whenever you transition from one area to the next, the load times felt excruciatingly long, especially considering the relatively small size of each zone. I have the game installed on 128 gig Samsung Evo Plus micro SD card, which has rated speeds that meet or exceed the, the capabilities listed on Nintendo's website for SD card read write speeds. The last issue I had, albeit very small, is that while running from one side of a zone to another, I would sometimes experience these random little hiccups when the game looked like it paused for like a split second before going back to normal. It didn't seem like a dip in the frame rate, but more like a hiccup while accessing game files or something. It was really minor and not at all invasive to my gameplay, it was just something that I noticed while I was playing. At this point, I'm going to transition over to my spoiler filled talk about the twists in the game, the ending, and my overall impression. So if you haven't checked out the game yet, you really, really shouldn't spoil it for yourself because this is the, ty is the type of game that is best experienced when going in blind. I was suffering from a pretty rough game hangover today after I beat the game, so I decided to start it back up and see if I missed anything. The first thing I noticed was that the, the choices I had in the main menu were simply the games option and the continue timeline. And that's kind of when it really hit me. There was no new game option because it wasn't really over. I thought I'd beat the game, despite the last minute twist that showed me Alex was still stuck in the loop, but in reality, I had just completed one loop. One iteration with one outcome out of many, possibly endless iterations. I began to feel uneasy because I knew that there was likely no real good ending, and at the end of the day, someone was going to have to suffer for the well-being of the others. There is one possible ending where the loop is finally broken. 
In this ending, or is it a beginning, our Alex sacrifices herself to send a message to her former self, or is it her future self, telling her to stay away from Edward's Island. Ren, Jonas, and Alex never ride the ferry to port and never use the radio in the cave. So the creepy time ghost people are never allowed to possess her friends and threaten the very existence of our protagonists. But it's in the same ending that Michael isn't saved from drowning, which means Clarissa still blames Alex for Michael's death, causing intense distrust and anger between those two characters. It also means Ren never gets his date with Nona, and Jonas doesn't bond with, with Alex during their tribulations on the island. So is that the best ending? Maybe for Alex, but I would argue it's not at all the best for Clarissa or Ren, let alone Michael, who is literally dead because we chose to never save him. The forums are full of people discussing this ending, and whether or not Alex herself is even saved. Does her message to herself prevent her from ever going to the island, or is there still an Alex somewhere trapped in the void, waiting endlessly for an end that will never come? So the loop never really ends until you, as the person holding the controller, decides it does. In my first playthrough, when Alex was given the choice to sacrifice herself for Clarissa, Alex said that sacrificing herself for her friends was worth it, and maybe she's right. I know all of these characters are fictional, so this may seem a bit too somber, a bit too serious, but do we, as Alex, really have the right to say that Michael deserves to die because we opted to stay away from the island? How about Clarissa? The ghosts give us the option to let them possess her, giving Alex and the rest of her friends a scapegoat while they can escape the island, but should we? This game is so exciting and interesting and horrifying because every time you play it, you're subjecting the characters in this tale to another iteration of the loop. If you stop though, whoever ended up being sacrificed will inevitably meet the same fate as the wayward souls from the USS Kanaloa. Their existence will slowly fade as they fade from our minds, till all that remains is the raw emotions to remind us of what was experienced. We experienced wonder, sadness, guilt, and relief, while whoever was sacrificed will be reduced to the raw fear regret and anger at having been left behind, forgotten and robbed of their lives, memories, names, and faces. At this point, having been sufficiently filled with dread and a sense of overwhelming doom, I hopped on my computer and began to watch YouTube videos of the other endings that people got, as well as reading other theories about what it all meant, and tons and tons of forum posts about hidden messages embedded in the game's soundtrack, as well as the Morse code sprinkled throughout the game. I started to get pretty wigged out by the sheer scale of the meta story, that the developers had created. Hearing people talk about the object and secret phone numbers was just crazy. It seems like there are still a lot of secrets left to uncover. It was both exciting and daunting. It's super obvious that the developers, Night School Studio, poured an insane amount of love, time, and effort into making this game as awesome as it could possibly be. As of right now, I don't really know what to make of Oxen Free. I started it under the pretense that it was just a pretty straightforward little game with a fun story, and now I'm sitting at my desk at 2am, wondering whether I'm a bad person for, for putting my controller down and subjecting someone to an eternity of fear while they slowly lose themselves to an endless loop of time. So I guess if you love experiencing an overwhelming sense of dread and sorrow, you should definitely check out Oxenfree, whether it's on the Switch, PC, PS4, or Xbox One. If you enjoy a compelling story full of mystery and intrigue, with plenty of twists and choices, you should definitely check it out. But if you want to enjoy life ever again without the feeling of regret and guilt looming over your head, maybe put this one on the backlog for another time. But in all seriousness, I really truly enjoyed this game. It kept me wondering and thinking for hours after I put the controller down for the night. It seems to pretty frequently go on sale, for as cheap as like 5 bucks, so at that price, how could you afford to not pick it up? Personally, I would give Oxen Free a solid 8.5 out of 10.